Allora, buongiorno a tutti e benvenuti ai colleghi che sono collegati. Oggi è un privilegio presentare questo nono evento formativo che riguarda l'arbitrato, in questo caso l'arbitrato internazionale. E tra l'altro lo facciamo oltre che con Giorgio Leccisi, che è il presidente del Consiglio Direttivo della Camera Arbitrale, e con il professor Sbarbaro, che è componente anche lui della nostra Camera Arbitrale e che ha coordinato tutti questi eventi formativi. Lo facciamo col professor Gemma, che è un nostro amico e di iscritto, con la collega Fontanelli e soprattutto eh, con due colleghi eh, francesi che sono Elie Clayman e Claire Poli. Spero di non aver sbagliato, di non aver sbagliato i nomi e mi fa particolarmente piacere che eh, trattando un tema internazionale ci sono gli ospiti eh, diciamo, eh, europei e quindi possono eh, darci una mano a sviluppare eh, questo tema. Quindi li saluto, saluto i loro ordini professionali e mi fa piacere che eh, questo, eh, questo evento formativo vada sul solco della eh, progressiva apertura all'esterno e quindi l'internazionalizzazione del nostro ordine forense che è un percorso complicato che però stiamo cercando di portare a compimento con eh, piccoli passi e piccole tappe. Quindi grazie davvero a tutti, grazie ai nostri prestigiosi ospiti e lascio la parola come sempre a Giorgio Leccisi che introdurrà i lavori di oggi. Grazie, buonasera a tutti, buonasera al Presidente Galletti, ai colleghi del direttivo, a tutti i colleghi avvocati del Foro di Roma e, e tutti i colleghi degli, anche degli altri fori che in tanti ci fanno l'onore di collegarsi da remoto per seguire il corso sull'arbitrato che la Camera eh, sta organizzando assieme al supporto fondamentale del Consiglio dell'Ordine degli Avvocati, sia in una prospettiva di formazione sia nell'ottica di questo lavoro di normalizzazione che stiamo cercando di svolgere ormai da alcuni mesi sulla materia arbitrale. Siamo al nono incontro, come diceva il Presidente Galletti, che avvia il modulo di due seminari aventi ad oggetto l'arbitrato internazionale. Dopo una prima parte generale sui temi della clausola arbitrale, del procedimento, delle diverse tipologie di arbitrato, in una seconda parte abbiamo approfondito alcuni dei settori più rilevanti per l'operatività delle controversie arbitrali, il diritto del lavoro, dello sport, il diritto societario, poi il diritto finanziario, assicurativo, dei consumatori. Nell'ultimo incontro abbiamo affrontato l'arbitrato nel diritto amministrativo, nei contratti pubblici, nel diritto tributario, in cui ovviamente ci sono delle peculiarità determinanti, se non altro per le situazioni giuridiche soggettive che vengono in rilievo e per la natura delle parti del giudizio arbitrale data la presenza necessaria della pubblica amministrazione. In tutti questi settori si verificano grandissime potenzialità operative per lo strumento arbitrale, in termini di utilità per gli avvocati, che sono ovviamente i nostri primi interlocutori nell'ambito di questo corso, ma poi soprattutto per le parti e per gli operatori economici, Utilità che si prospettano ancora di più negli arbitrati internazionali che sono il tema dell'approfondimento odierno e in effetti rispetto all'opzione all giurisdizionale si verifica anche in questo caso una riduzione dei gap informativi e comunicativi tra, tra parti e difensori, ciò che agevola anche le comunicazioni ma che agevola l'andamento della procedura e e, e, e la minore distanza riduce le distanze con il decisore questo è ovvio nell'arbitrato interno quando l'arbitro è espressione di parte e il presidente del collegio è designato d'intesa tra gli arbitri delle parti ma eh, diciamo riduce la, la distanza anche solo in termini di comunicazione restando ferme le necessarie ineludibili precondizioni di indipendenza che nell'arbitrato internazionale sono altrettanto importanti, ma che nel contempo servono a garantire sia la terzietà del decisore, sia l'apparenza di tale terzietà e la fiducia nell'istituzione arbitrale agli occhi delle parti, che nell'arbitrato internazionale è molto importante. Si riducono anche i fattori di incertezza rispetto alle posizioni soggettive, no? le posizioni giuridiche, anche quelle complesse, in minor tempo, anche beneficiando di margini di riservatezza sull'esistenza del contenzioso e sui suoi costi, 
c'è un risparmio di tempi per arrivare alla decisione con beneficio per tutti, non solo per la parte, la parte debole che è solitamente creditrice, ma in generale per l'economia, perché si consente una più rapida circolazione dei diritti e quindi minore staticità delle posizioni, dinamismo dei fattori produttivi. Questo vale anche a maggior ragione nell'arbitrato internazionale, lo facciamo oggi, apriamo questo modulo con degli ospiti davvero d'eccezione che ci hanno onorato di aver accettato l'invito, li saluto con grandissimo piacere, eh, Monsieur Eli Claiman, uno dei maggiori esperti mondiali di arbitrato internazionale, presidente onorario di Paris Place d'Arbitrage, Claire Poli, anch'essa esperta di arbitrato e contenzioso internazionale, entrambi sono docenti all'Università Paris de Panthéon, Sciences Po, la mitica Sciences Po, eh, e rispettivamente partner e counsel di Jones Day, uno dei più grandi e conosciuti studi legali del mondo, l'avvocato Elena Fontanelli, deputy counsel della ICC, istituzione leader mondiale nel settore arbitrale, per essere la Camera Arbitrale e la Camera di Commercio Internazionale, il professor Gemma, professore di diritto privato a Roma 3, ma amico e componente del Consiglio Direttivo della Camera Arbitrale, a quali do a tutti il benvenuto, anche se solo telematicamente a Roma, presso la Camera, cher Monsieur Clayman, Madame Poli, Madame Fontanelli, je vous prie de croire à l'immense plaisir que j'ai de me retrouver avec vous, s'il vous plaît, croyez-moi à l'honneur que vous nous avez fait en acceptant notre invitation, pour cela, je voudrais juste remercier Monsieur le Professeur Andrea Gemma, e Monsieur le professor Ferruccio Sbarbaro per la mediazione determinante. Thank you Andrea, thank you Ferruccio for everything you're doing for the Roman lawyers family. Certes, nous aurions préféré célébrer cette occasion en présentiel, hélas nous le faisons en ligne. L'avantage est que nous pouvons avoir un colloque avec vous à la présence de quelques centaines d'inscrits. Juste hier, nous avions 270 inscrits pour le séminaire. Sans compter que le colloque pourra être suivi en streaming sur YouTube. Nous n'avons pas trop de temps, juste deux heures. Nous allons donc aller directement sur les thèmes de l'arbitrage international. D'ailleurs, la France et Paris sont la maison du droit de l'arbitrage. Et en ce sens, Rome a beaucoup à apprendre sur les facteurs d'attractivité de la France et de Paris, comme place d'arbitrage, comme place désormais d'une justice internationale et non d'un annexe de la juridiction étatique. Certes, la France a toujours eu de l'ambition et a toujours osé, et pour cela, toujours soutenu d'importants investissements sur ces institutions, ayant doté Paris de plus d'une institution pour l'arbitrage. D'un côté, récemment, deux chambres commerciales internationales ont été instituées au tribunal de commerce de Paris, à la cour d'appel de Paris. Le juge d'appui, d'autre côté, juge d'origine prétorienne, qui a été prévu par la loi, comme juge à qui les parties peuvent se référer si elles connaissent des difficultés qui peuvent intervenir lors de la mise en œuvre des modalités de désignation du ou des arbitres. De plus, en France en 2011, euh, si je ne me trompe, la France a codifié le droit de l'arbitrage, ce qui, avec la position de la jurisprudence, surtout celle de la Cour de cassation, a ultérieurement développé une sensibilité qui aujourd'hui mène à la considération non seulement du droit du commerce, des échanges et des transactions internationales, mais aussi à l'enjeu des droits fondamentaux dans la jurisprudence d'arbitrage. Et en effet, excusez-moi, je reviens à l'italien, la France a investi dans les institutions arbitrales, a doté de Paris de au moins deux institutions de gouvernement des arbitrages, près de la Cour d'appel de Paris, près du Tribunal du Commerce, e poi nel 2011 ha codificato il diritto dell'arbitrato che si è recepito la giurisprudenza ma ha consentito anche un impulso per lo sviluppo dell'arbitrato c'è una norma se non sbaglio nel codice di procedura civile francese eh, che, ha, eh, che prevede che quando non c'è anche quando non c'è un nesso con la Francia quando le parti sono straniere quando la clausola non lo prevede il giudice di Parigi può intervenire quando una delle parti ha necessità ad esempio perché è esposta a un diniego di giustizia. La loi française autorise le juge de Paris à connaître les affaires qui concernent les arbitrages internationaux, même quand le contrat ou la clause ne le prévoit pas, dans le cas où l'une des parties a exposé à un risque de déni de justice. E questo non è un caso che quindi Parigi, assieme a Londra, sia il top in materia, eh, a livello mondiale. 
non, non per niente Parigi si attesta a questi livelli e per questo ci fa un grandissimo onore la presenza eh, dei nostri ospiti. Certo questa codificazione ha lasciato dei problemi ancora aperti, per esempio nell'arbitrabilità dei litigi sugli investimenti, eh, investimenti intracomunitari o sulla carta dell'energia, su il giudice, il Conseil d'État o il Cours de Cassation, Uh, sulle competenze no? quando il contratto è un, un contratto pubblico ancora non si sa ci sono dei problemi dei problemi che da noi sarebbero risolti con la Costituzione ma certo questa codificazione ha permesso una, una chiarificazione de, per gli operatori e per le imprese no? ha, ha, detto, ha chiarito ha codificato i principi di celerità e lealtà Arbitri, fate più veloce, sanzionate le pratiche dilatorie delle parti, infatti in media i procedimenti durano mi pare 20 mesi, ma nel contempo ha incrementato i controlli di indipendenza degli arbitri, quindi una codificazione che permette di affermare che l'arbitrato non è un gioco tra le parti priva di rego, privo di regole, l'arbitrage n'est pas un autre soi non régulé, ma è un microcosmo regolato con delle garanzie per le parti. Insomma, Abbiamo tantissimo da imparare eh, dalla Francia, non vedo l'ora di sentire i nostri ospiti, li ringrazio nuovamente di tutto cuore della mh, loro partecipazione, con la speranza di vederli dal vivo e l'espoir de vous voir en présence a Roma. Lascio la parola all'amico professor Sbarbaro, che ringrazio sempre per il lavoro di coordinamento del corso, rinnovo i saluti ai colleghi da remoto, grazie davvero per la partecipazione a distanza e vi auguro un'ottima prosecuzione dei lavori e arrivederci. Grazie. Grazie Giorgio, sarò brevissimo perché non voglio togliere altro spazio agli, agli ospiti eh, che ringrazio, ringrazio l'amica Elena Fontanelli che tra l'altro abbiamo presentato giustamente come Deputy Council dell'ICC anche se in realtà è in corso un suo, un suo cambio perché sta sta per trasferirsi uno dei più importanti studi legali italiani, ma direi anche internazionali, per proseguire così il suo percorso, eh, dopo una significativa esperienza, importante esperienza presso l'ICC, però ovviamente oggi ci testimonierà di quello evidentemente, sono notizie di queste ore insomma. Uh, I'm very glad to meet uh, French colleagues, uh, Elie Craiman and Claire Poli, and really thank you for being available today. I can't wait to hear your, your, your speech. Eh, per i colleghi dell'ordine, io veramente rubo solo un altro minuto appunto per proseguire la presentazione di Giorgio da un punto di vista eh, strettamente organizzativo del corso. Come Giorgio ha sottolineato poco fa, abbiamo iniziato con i fondamenti dell'arbitrato, poi ci siamo dedicati all'arbitrato negli specifici settori, ci siamo soffermati varie volte sulla funzione che può avere l'incentivo all'utilizzo dello strumento arbitrale nel contesto del nostro ordine che diciamo certamente ha come prima, primo effetto quello di eh, evitare la dilatazione dei tempi, di cercare anche a volte di essere un, ince un incentivo a delle soluzioni transattive, nel caso dell'arbitrato internazionale a eh, cui ci affacciamo nell'incontro di oggi e nel prossimo di lunedì 28 c'è anche un tema di armonizzazione perché dove, dove, non arriva, eh, dove non arrivano i legislatori, nemmeno quello comunitario nel nostro caso, può arrivare nel caso dei rapporti commerciali internazionali lo strumento arbitrale che a volte è anche la ragione per cui un'operazione commerciale internazionale si compie, e magari ciò non avverrebbe se le parti dovessero, fossero tenute a scegliere una legge nazionale e una giurisdizione nazionale dell'una o dell'altra parte quindi c'è un tema più ampio che sicuramente verrà fuori oggi um, quindi uh, I, I, I leave, the, I leave, the, I leave Andrea taking the lead of today's lecture and thank again to all the guests today for being here and I'll, I'll be one of the most interested in the audience. Okay, thank you, Andrea. Grazie Ferruccio, uh, è stato detto tutto e, e aggiungo solamente che um, è stato un gesto di particolare affettuosità la conferma della partecipazione di Elie e di Claire, di cui sono estremamente grato 
e che testimonia una forte disponibilità dei colleghi ad un dibattito eh, in termini di, eh, come dire, di prontezza e di messa a servizio delle proprie competenze. Aggiungo due elementi, effettivamente e lì è, è, è un'istituzione, oggi noi abbiamo due privilegi perché abbiamo una superstar dell'arbitrato internazionale ed una rising star dell'arbitrato internazionale come Claire, quindi diciamo in aggiunta a Elena Fontanelli che è già una, una stella e di primissima grandezza per la sua esperienza, oggi abbiamo una, un, un contesto di primissimo rilievo. Vorrei fare Vorrei subito cedere la parola ai nostri interventori secondo un'organizzazione che prevede prima l'intervento di Eli a seguire quello di Elena e poi Claire in chiusura secondo una piccola rimodulazione dell'agenda dell'ordine del giorno della nostra locandina e voglio esprimere i miei complimenti eh, molto sentiti a, a Giorgio Leccisi che ha preso con grande, ha preso veramente a cuore questa lezione sull'arbitrato si è preparato con grande attenzione, è un entusiasta, sta facendo in maniera assolutamente egregia il Presidente della Camera Arbitrale e gliene va riconosciuto il plauso e il merito perché è un istancabile animatore di questo dibattito, ci mette il tempo, ci mette l'attenzione, ci mette una straordinaria energia che ci fa andare tutti nella direzione giusta. Having said that, uh, I would like to leave the stage to Elie Clément who has been uh, already introduced, so without uh, uh, further discussion, Eli, please uh, take the stage and uh, tell us about the basics of international arbitration. At the end of the, your 20 minutes, I, I, I might send you a short message and leave you five or 10 more minutes in case you need it. And good luck and thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, dear Andrea, and, and, and thank you, uh, heartfelt thanks to each and every one of you. It is truly an honor and a pleasure to, to be given an opportunity today in such a fantastic uh, setting with such esteemed colleagues. And I would like to say that arbitration, uh, in particular international arbitration, is uh, extremely well suited uh, for a reunion of Uh, lawyers from diverse backgrounds, but it's even more pleasurable when traditions of a great civil law uh, have an opportunity to converge and, and meet and, and discuss um, a, a wonderful tool such as international arbitration, which, is, which lends itself really for civil lawyers to make the best international use of. And the basics of international arbitration are uh, a, a great way to, to approach this field, in particular if we have uh, colleagues and, and, and attorneys who, who, who are not really familiar with arbitration, uh, because it's very important to stress that international arbitration is not the same thing, not the same animal, if you want, as domestic arbitration. The reason why it is so is that international arbitration is supposed to fit the needs of users uh, who come from, as I said, very diverse backgrounds. And also international arbitration is not uh, available to suit the particular purposes of a local policy. Arbitration is actually a thing of contract and it is made to suit the interest of the parties who decide uh, to use arbitration as the method for uh, the resolution of conflicts. So I would like to stress to begin uh, that arbitration is indeed the preferred methodology for the resolution of cross-border disputes. This is not something that needs to be demonstrated. It is a matter of fact. It is a matter of fact in, uh, for example, a civil law country such as France, based on regular studies and, and, and uh, interviews with users. As you know, in Paris, we have the headquarters of the ICC, but the ICC is very well known uh, in Italy. And uh, this is also true, for example, in the common law world. And recently, uh, year on, act actually, year after year, uh, uh, now very famous uh, study of the Queen Mary uh, University in London, um, 
is 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 always an opportunity uh, to uh, to to ask users of arbitration and in particular um, general counsel working in large international companies what their preferred method of resolving cross border dispute is and ninety seven percent ninety seven percent of them have chosen international arbitration, whether it's international arbitration combined with ADR before you go to arbitration or arbitration to begin with, that's a sum of 97. That means that only 3% of them said that they preferred the court system. And there's a very clear reason why uh, they do so. And if you ask them exactly what are the three main reasons for preferring arbitration, most of them will say that enforcement worldwide is the key reason why they prefer arbitration because of the New York Convention, and maybe I'll say a word on that in a, in a second. The second reason is to avoid the specific legal systems of the national courts and this is the second best reason. And the reason why they want to avoid the local courts at any cost uh, is that most of the time they, they don't have a chance to impose their own system. And so rather than accepting to argue a dispute before the court of the other party, which by definition is an alien court, they much prefer to settle on a neutral setting, a neutral seat, which is arbitration. And the third reason is the flexibility of international arbitration. Arbitration is very much the creature of the contract. The parties have lots of options. Of course, it's not only a thing of contract, it's also a judicial uh, process. And for that reason, there are some basics that need to be respected, but we'll touch on that in a second. I did mention enforceability, and I would like to stress for those who are new to international arbitration that most, if not all, that most international arbitral awards, uh, um, awards that means the decisions given in arbitration, are generally uh, readily enforced. They are accepted by the losing party most of the time. But it's true that gradually, as arbitration has become more and more uh, um, litig I mean, litigious, as I mean, since it, 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 it has morphed from an exceptional form of justice to the most used form of justice, uh, statistically, there have been more and more post-award recourses. And the, the the important thing to bear in mind here is that those recourses can be brought before the judge where the arbitration took place, that's one, but en enforcement abroad, outside of the seat of arbitration, is left to local judges who must generally apply the New York Convention on uh, the enforce on the recognition and enforcement of arbitral award. More, I think today we have more than 168 or maybe even 170 signatories of uh, the uh, New York Convention, which uh, was uh, entered into in 1958, which means that all the judges in the countries that are signatories to the New York Convention must apply the same criteria. And the important thing to bear in mind is that revision of the award is not allowed. That means that once the, the, the dispute has been decided by arbitrators, there are very little ways uh, to challenge uh, the, the, the solution. Having said that, and before I turn to uh, my next point, um, there have... Uh, there, ha there have to be reasons why arbitration is not so great. And I mean, we have to be objective here. And there are at least three characteristics of arbitration that, has un that are unanimously not desired by uh, those who ch still choose arbitration. The first one is the cost. Arbitration is more expensive than court proceedings in most countries. That's not always the case. It's less expensive than court proceedings in England or in America, for example, because, uh, because this is a very expensive legal system. It also needs to be compared to the full cost 
of protracted litigation in the courts of law of one country. For example, in France, you could have a dispute that goes on for 10 or 15 years. And you, you know in Italy that you have the same type of, of, of uh, issue, and that's why you're trying to reform your system. But in arbitration, the duration is, is more limited, but still the cost is compressed and there's a lot of money that needs to be available. So that's one. The second point is that arbitrators generally don't have effective sanctions during the arbitral process. Because they owe their duty to the parties, they are generally reluctant to be as brave as they could. And even if they wanted to be brave, sometimes they just cannot do certain things because they lack the imperium. But the judge has the sword. Arbitrators have no sword. They only have the scales. So that's one known uh, uh, disadvantage of arbitration. The third one is the lack of power uh, of arbitrators vis-a-vis -vis non signatories of the contracts. Third parties uh, uh, are outsiders and arbitrators have no way to impose rulings on third parties, which sometimes uh, is a, a disadvantage too. So enough of those uh, general uh, uh, points, and I would like uh, now to focus uh, on uh, the best practices for using the party's freedom. As I mentioned, uh, because arbitration is a thing of contract, the parties have a lot of freedom in the way they approach arbitration. And to begin with, I would like to say a few words on the arbitration clause uh, or the arbitration agreement, because it all starts there with with the contract, the meeting of the minds. And when discussing an arbitral, an arbitration provision, most of the time clients don't take the time. That's why they need you, they need all of us to be available for advice to them, even if they wait for the last minute before signing the contract. They need to take advice and ask themselves the right, the right questions about the arbitration clause. So it starts with the scope of the clause. What do you, what sort of disputes do you want to bring to arbitration? Are there any disputes that you want to leave out? Uh, it's also an opportunity to think about the seat of the arbitration. Then you need to think about the institution. Do I want an institution or do I want ad hoc arbitration? And then you can uh, have more details, you can think about how the governing law provision and the arbitration clause will work together, to what extent specific powers must be given to the arbitral tribunal because they cannot be taken for granted. How many arbitrators do I want? Uh, do I want to stage arbitration clause starting with mediation? So you see there are lots of choices and there are no ready-made solutions. So I will not get into the details, but if I had to say four basic principles, key points to have in mind in terms of choosing the seat of the arbitration, which is the place where legally the arbitration will be, uh, will, will take place and where challenges against arbitrators could be made and where challenges against the award could be made. You need to pick a seat in a stable arbitration jurisdiction arbitration-friendly jurisdiction. It could be Roma, it could be Paris, it could be London, it could be Geneva. I mean, there are lots of places in the world that have the well-proven tradition of arbitration-friendliness. But one should be wary of places that have not yet given rise to a well-defined uh, tradition of arbitration-friendliness. The governing law is also very important, even though generally that clause is not necessarily placed in the arbitration provision, but you, one needs to think uh, uh, about how the governing law and the arbitration provision will work together. For example, uh, under certain governing laws, arbitrators cannot make certain type of decisions like daily fines if somebody in late uh, is late in the in the in the performance of uh, of uh, of an obligation um, or some. There might be some conflicting positions on whether a matter can be brought to arbitration at all. So that's an important thing to bear in mind. Now, also the arbitrators need to be given a broad enough uh, scope uh, uh, of powers. And particularly, sometimes you see arbitration clauses where the parties try to define uh, the type of disputes that can go to arbitration, and sometimes it's a result of poor drafting, but there can be uncertainties, and so that can be damaging. 
And finally, the rules. I mean, most arbitration in uh, the international uh, world are governed by institutional rules. You could also have ad hoc arbitration, but then you could also think about having rules that apply to ad hoc arbitration, such as the ancestral rules, for example, or the Paris rules, uh, which are meant for arbitral, uh, for ad hoc arbitration, even though I'm not sure they have received much success, I have to say modestly, and Citroën are far uh, uh, more popular. Now, now, in the nice to have categories, you can also think about, uh, I mentioned the escalation procedure from negotiation to mediation, so I, I, I will I will stop there. But you can think about how you uh, allocate power and options to uh, go for emergency relief before court, or if you want emergency relief in arbitration, think about checking that in the rules. And also you may want to have fast track arbitration, also known as expedited procedures, which might be very useful in particular, if it's possible to seek a, a, a payment order from the arbitrators without waiting for the full arbitration to unfold. And uh, finally, two clauses that are hugely important. One is procedural, that's joinder uh, uh, and consolidation. Uh, uh, what I have in mind here is multiple contracts between the same parties or multiple contracts between a multitude of parties. All that requires extremely detailed attention. And the second point I wanted to mention is language. Where today uh, I'm speaking a language that I've borrowed from other people, and most of you might end up in this position because, let's face it, uh, English is the new uh, uh, Latin uh, uh, of, of, of our times. And so it's important to think about language. And when you don't want uh, to be solely arguing in English, it's important to say so. And it's also important to think about the costs. But the last thing you want is arbitration in, in language that is very difficult to access and where you cannot have quality arbitration console. Now, turning to... Uh, uh, a few points that I mentioned, and before I embark on the uh, on on well, I'm 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 almost uh, I'm almost done, uh, but I still need to discuss a couple of choices. Uh, when I did mention expedited procedures. I wanted to make sure that you had in mind that you could have expedited procedures, for example, in the ICC rules. Uh, there's a, a belief that uh, it's only made for small claims, but it's actually not the case. The ICC will accept derogation to the rule when the parties call the ICC and say, well, my dispute is going to be maybe 20 million, but it's a simple dispute. For example, it's it's a bank guarantee. It's an independent on-demand guarantee. Can I have expedited arbitration? The answer, of course you can. The answer is, of course you can. So think about asking the ICC whether it's possible in your case to have expedited rules, even though uh, the, the value at stake uh, excesses, uh, exceeds, I mean, the 3 million uh, amount. Preliminary relief, local court or arbitration. My advice to you is try to get both if you can, but be wary on of the knock-on impact of emergency proceedings in a local court uh, if you want to have arbitration. Uh, sometimes, I mean, it's a difficult balance, I won't say more, but sometimes you really need the options. And I would just think that some the right questions are, what sort of relief do I want? Do I want an award or do I want a simple order? Do I need to have the judicial assistance of the judge, the power of the imperium, or am I happy with a simple declaration that the parties should do something? Um, and then, of course, you need to think about where do I need to enforce my measures? I will... I had announced that I would discuss a summary dismissal and the multi-party dispute. I'll be very brief on that. I mean, summary dismissal is very important in certain cases like construction contracts where you can end up, you know, in four years of arbitration uh, that you could have spared yourself if you had the ability to tell the tribunal, for example, well, we settled this and that point. So we want an, um, we want an urgent decision from the tribunal sort out what is still a matter that is uh, fit for arbitration and what should be decided, uh, which, which should be left out as res judicata. 
This is just an example, but this is called dispositive motion. The uh, US uh, system uh, uh, is, is actually a good experience of this kind of things for because they have uh, uh, notions such as right of action, uh, legal standards, but even in the civil law world where things are less defined, uh, it's still very helpful, in particular for time limitation and for settlement defenses. Multi-party dispute and joinder and consolidation, we would need another three hours to discuss this at length. So oh, what I want to say is that if you have multiple contracts and you have a risk of multiple arbitrations, you need to ask yourself, uh, are my interests better served with orderly resolution with all disputes going before the same institution and possibly before the same arbitrators? Or do I want chaos? If you want chaos, make sure to have different clauses, courts, arbitration, different institutions. Uh, I can guarantee you that you will have full chaos. If you want an orderly res res resolution of a dispute, it's probably a good idea to have the same institution and have specific wording uh, whereby the parties promise to cooperate. You would still have some disadvantages, in particular the fact that you may need to say goodbye to the ability to appoint your preferred arbitrator because you'll have multiple parties and it might be for the institution to appoint the arbitrators, which is a good, a good, a good segue with the last point I wanted to, to, to discuss, which is arbitration selection. One of the key drivers for arbitration is, is also the fact that one can choose uh, at least one out of three of the arbitrators and more generally, it's also very comforting to expect that arbitration will be um, uh, the, the, the possibility to refer the dispute to people who know the sector, who know the trade, who have a strong reputation, uh, who have a cosmopolitan ac approach to diverse cultures and legal traditions, and who's also a hard thinker and a hard worker. And, and you don't always get that from the local courts. Sometimes you get one, uh, for example, you have a hard thinker, but the hard thinker is just swamped with a multitude of cases. So that's the problem. Uh, and so uh, you need to consider impartiality and independence, but you also need to consider how many cases the person you have in mind has to deal with, because the, the stars in arbitration are also uh, sometimes very busy, and the risk you can have is that they delegate the award uh, to some younger colleagues, which you don't want. So what you need to bear in mind is, of course, that arbitrators who are professional arbitrators would know exactly how to deal with impartiality and independence, and they're familiar with disclosures of circumstances which could lead the parties to question their independence, but some of the people are not. That's why we have standards. For example, uh, uh, there are the IBA guidelines on conflict of interest, uh, which sometimes hurt the reputation of being maybe too compliance-minded, but in reality, they have become uh, the dominant way to approach uh, independence and impartiality. And uh, in France, for example, uh, the court now refers to those standards uh, and the ICC has embraced them in the notes uh, to arbitrators. And... Uh, I have to say that having practiced those standards uh, in, in many, many uh, cases, I find them very usable and very fair. Now, if you have in mind challenging an arbitrator, you need to think about, of course, building the case. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I want to send one warning signal in arbitration uh, courts uh, will look at what the parties did during the arbitration. So if you're thinking of an objection, it's important to put it on the record. Otherwise, there will be a deemed waiver of your objection. So that's one important thing. The second thing is that uh, once you have made your objection, you, you do not have to repeat it all the time, but think about uh, the potential blowback if, for example, you challenge uh, the chair uh, because if you, as they say, if you aim for the king, 
you mustn't miss. So the question is, once you've made your challenge, uh, you may need to live with an arbitrator who has been uh, uh, upset. So this is not a matter that can be uh, approached lightly. And I think before challenging an arbitrator, one has to think long and hard about uh, this the strength of the challenge and the consequences. I think it's a good time to stop. Uh, I'm looking at the clock and I've exceeded by three minutes, which I think is not too bad. But Look, uh, if you have questions, I'll be happy to take them later. Thank you, Lee. Uh, 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 it has been wonderful to, to listen to this uh, really comprehensive view. Uh, I understand that it has been extremely difficult, this kind of intervention from your side, because you were put in a position which was uh, rather, or rather, you know, uh, very complex to manage because you have to speak about everything without the possibility to dig in uh, and do a deep dive into the specific matter you want to discuss. Uh, however, uh, this has been wonderful to introduce the, the general picture to make, let's say, to design the frame of the discussion. And uh, I think that Elena and Claire will take benefit out of that. Uh, just to uh, open uh, the, the, the discussion to possible questions, I will say that in Italian, and then uh, I will uh, leave the stage to Elena. Uh, chiunque voglia fare delle domande tra gli intervenuti, le modalità della videoconferenza non sono interattive, nel senso che non è consentito sbloccare un microfono e prendere la parola. Tuttavia è possibile sulla, sulla chat che c'è nella connessione che abbiamo con YouTube di svolgere delle domande che ci vengono a, a loro volta riferite dalla regia sulla chat degli interventori e quindi in maniera più o meno tempestiva verificheremo se a valle o se a, alla fine della relazione di ciascun interventore potranno essere fatte magari una selezione delle domande eh, che possono essere poste. Questo sempre per rendere il più possibile interattiva la, la discussione. Thank you again, uh, Eli. Thank you so much. Uh, it has been a privilege and thank you for uh, finding your time to join us uh, and to be part of our uh, small but really, I would say, ambitious uh, core of people that likes to discuss about this subject. And then uh, I, I, I would like to leave the stage to Elena Fontanelli, who has been already introduced by Giorgio and Ferruccio. So uh, I, I will not spoil your time, uh, Elena, and let you go straight to the point. I leave you the word for discussion. And thank you so much to you. And thank again to Elie. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks all the organization and organizers for having invited me today. It's a great pleasure to discuss with you international arbitration. And in particular, today I will tackle the subject of international arbitration institutions, thanks to my ICC experience. I think that, first of all, it's useful to differentiate uh, institutional arbitration from adult arbitration in order to better understand the key role that international arbitration institutions play in the field of international arbitration. So in choosing uh, in institutional arbitration, contracting parties are agreeing to adopt uh, the procedural rules of a particular institution and to have the institution administer and supervise uh, the conduct of any arbitration that is commenced under the arbitration agreement. So specifically, the institutional institution involvement could include uh, uh, administering uh, the appointment of arbitrators, uh, for instance, uh, the confirmation, the appointment, the challenges of arbitrator, or determining the fee payable to the arbitrator, often by a reference to a fixed methodology set out in the institutional arbitration rules. Also overseeing the taking of deposits and making of payments of, of the arbitrators, and assisting in general in the logistics for hearings and sometimes even scrutinized draft awards to ensure enforceability. On the other end, adopt arbitration is an arbitration that parties manage themselves. It is conducted under rules adopted for the purpose of that specific arbitration without the involvement of any uh, arbitral institution. 
So the parties basically can draw up the arbitral rules themselves, leave the rules to the discretion of the arbitrators, or as usually it's more common, adopt rules specifically written for ad hoc arbitration, as Ellie mentioned before, for example, the unsitual rules. Then the parties, they need to conduct the arbitration in conjunction with the arbitrators directly. So in other words, the appointment of arbitrators and all the issues associated with the managing of the, of the proceeding themselves need to be arranged by the parties, always, of course, in conjunction with the arbitrators. So basically, on one hand, ad hoc arbitration gives more flexibility to the parties, as there will be no automatically application of uh, any institutional arbitration rules or any predetermined schedule for arbitrators or institutional fees. However, on the other, ad hoc arbitration lack the support of any institution. And so it depends basically the conduction of the arbitration itself to the full effectiveness on a spirit of a cooperation between the parties which, as you might understand, uh, usually lacks by the time uh, a dispute have arisen. So what are the international arbitration institutions and uh, why international arbitration institution is often covered over ad hoc arbitration? In general, we can define arbitral institution as a permanent organization with a set of its own arbitration rules that regulates regulates the service provided by the organization and the arbitration proceedings. The institution role is uh, more or less extensive depending on its arbitration rule, but the important mind that in no event uh, it is broken. So the jurisdictional function of deciding on the merits of the disputes resides with the arbitral tribunal only. In addition to the, ensure, the, 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 the conducting of, the, of uh, the proceedings, the managing of the proceedings, and the possibility to uh, have a, a set of arbitration rules to follow, the arbitral um, institution can assist the party with the constitution of the arbitral tribunal and, uh, generally speaking, of course, supervising the proper conduct of the arbitration proceedings from the beginning to the end. So, Having said that, uh, institutional arbitration is often favored because uh, the institutional rules themselves are designed to regulate the proceedings uh, in a way that uh, uh, the parties themselves uh, can uh, manage uh, the proceedings without having any, hopefully, delays. Because, as you might uh, understand, sometimes uh, also there are parties that fail or refuse to cooperate over the proceedings. So, the international arbitration, um, uh, the international arbitration institution rules can help parties also to avoid uh, very uh, complex situation in case of uh, a party refuse to cooperate. So, another important point uh, of incorporating uh, uh, institutional rules into the into a contract is that contracting parties can also avoid the time and expenses of drafting a suitable clause since the international arbitration uh, uh, suitable ad hoc clause, uh, since the international uh, arbitration institution provide also standard arbitration clause to insert into the contract. So, just to recap, uh, the main uh, advantages of institutional arbitration includes the presence of a default arbitration rules, the service from a permanent organization, and a higher degree of certainty in respect of the procedural aspect of the arbitration, the involvement uh, from arbitral institution on issue relating the procedural aspect of the arbitration, particularly at the beginning of the arbitral process, uh, such as an appointment of arbitrators or selection of an arbitral seat in case the parties have not agreed in the arbitration clause before. Or, for example, another point that is very useful for the parties is the fact that the, the, institutional, uh, the, the institutional arbitration manages the fees of the arbitral tribunal and the expenses of the arbitration, which, of course, uh, 
can uh, depends also on uh, the the set of the, the rules that the parties decide to include uh, in uh, in uh, in the in the arbitration clause. But generally speaking, so this gives uh, the parties um, would we'll say um, a preview of what the cost uh, could be um, at the end of the proceedings. And last but not least, uh, there are some arbitral institutions that also. Uh, provide the scrutiny of the wars to ensure enforceability. So the most important international arbitration institution are the International Chamber of Commerce, uh, the ICC, uh, which has the headquarters in Paris, but also other offices around the world, such as in New York, in Sao Paulo, Singapore, um, Hong Kong, uh, and recently also um, a new office has been opened in Abu Dhabi to cover uh, that region. Uh, the London Court of Arbitration, uh, um, so-called LCIA, is also a very prominent uh, um, institution with a headquarter in London, the International Center for Dispute Resolution, which is basically the international leg of the American Arbitration Association, which is based in New York, the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which is based in the Hague. International Center for Settlement on Investment Dispute, the so-called ICSID, which is the most commonly used forum for the investment uh, protection treaties, as well as in the practice of the investor state uh, arbitration. Um, the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, uh, the Singapore International Arbitration Center, and also the China International Economic and Trade Arbitration Commission, which are all based uh, in Asia. Uh, there are also other institutions that I would say they have a uh, higher involvement in specific regions, but they also have a role in the international uh, market, such as the, the, arbitra the Arbitration Institute of the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, the Cairo Regional Center for International Commercial Arbitration, the Dubai International Arbitration Center, the Swiss Arbitration Center, the Vienna International Arbitration Center, and last but not least, also the Milan uh, Chamber of Commerce, um, with many of you, I think, already um, familiar with them. Now, I want to share with you a bit of numbers to give you an idea of which are the most preferred arbitral tribunal institutions. Um, Ellie, before mentioned already, the Queen and Mary International Arbitration is a well-known survey in, uh, in the field. And so uh, this um, survey also tackle the issue of the most preferred arbitral uh, uh, institutions. And the survey shows that other arbitral institutions are, first of all, the ICC, which uh, stands out as uh, the most preferred one for the 90, uh, for the, sorry, the 57% uh, of respondents followed by the Singapore International Arbitration Center, 49% of respondents. I mentioned the, the Singapore International Arbitration Center is the preferred one. Uh, the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, 44%. And finally, the London Court of Arbitration, 39%. I would say that these uh, top four chosen have been in the market for well over a decade. Um, so, as you might have understood, uh, nowadays there are many international arbitration institutions uh, and parties sometimes uh, um, have, uh, they might have difficulties to navigate uh, um, among all these institutions. So, how can party choose effectively the institution that better suits to their case? In my opinion, six criteria should be considering in choosing among international arbitration institutions. First, um, the relative advantages of disadvantages of any distinction among the set of institutional rules. Second, the relative abilities and the preferences of the institutions with respect to the arbitrator appointment. Third, the relative experience and ability of the institution administrator or secretariat respecting his administration. Fourth, the relative reputation, insofar as a reputation may enhance or undermine the prospects of enforcement of an arbitral award. Fifth, the cost, both administrative and arbitrator fees. And last but not least, 
whether certain arbitration institutions are better suited for arbitration in certain locations in the world. Besides my personal opinion, as a general rule, I would say that a newly formed institution or institution without a proven track record should be definitely avoided. Having said so, there is no magic formula for choosing uh, uh, between them. Also, because increasingly, day by day, we see institution and institutional rules offering similar process with a little to distinguish between them. An example is the widespread introduction of a mechanism such as the emergency arbitration. Um, once uh, it was uh, a key distinguished feature of all in certain leading institutions, and now day by day it's, uh, um, it's, it has been introduced in also other set of, uh, of uh, international arbitration institution rule. Such similarity uh, leads parties to look more subjective factor in deciding uh, which institution to use. Could be, for example, the institution reputation or a previous experience uh, with an institution, the depth and breadth of arbitrators, the quality and consistency of the institution uh, staff, and also the cost. Another key uh, consideration for parties is uh, the chosen uh, seat of arbitration. As indeed, uh, Ellie already mentioned, the selection of the seat uh, is uh, generally viewed as a, a very important uh, um, aspect that sometimes uh, it can be considered even more important the selection of institution uh, itself uh, that uh, is it determines the procedural rule of the arbitration, the court responsible for applying the procedural law, and uh, let's say the nationality of the award for enforcement purposes. Uh, very well-known institution based uh, in the party's uh, chosen seat uh, will often uh, will be viewed, I would say, as a more uh, favorable because of its perceivement uh, uh, of the association with uh, the knowledge uh, of uh, how things work in the seat. For example, ICC, which is based in Paris, of course, knows very well how things work uh, in the French and how things work in the French court. That say, of course, there is nothing uh, stopping uh, the parties from choosing an institution in a jurisdiction that differs from the seat of the arbitration and the governing law. Even if, in my opinion, in my opinion is, it's sensible to align governing law and the seat. But having said so, this consideration uh, are often uh, personal to the parties involved uh, and they need to be analyzed case by case. It is very important to provide only for a framework for the procedure of the arbitration. So the way in which the arbitration is conducted, is conducted will be determined by the specific approach of each arbitrator. Factors such as the degree of experience in international arbitration, the legal background and the training and the views of the legal issue for determination in the arbitration, of course, will influence their approach. Approach. So the parties, it's essential to consider carefully the approach um, that they want uh, the arbitral tribunal to take when selecting uh, the arbitrator. So, uh, um, again, uh, the survey of the Queen and uh, an international arbitration survey of the Queen and Mary um, University uh, also um, has given us. Um, uh, some uh, um, indication about the principal uh, drivers uh, behind the uh, choice of institution that are, uh, as the, the survey has uh, shown, uh, the general reputation of the institution and the user's previous, uh, uh, previous uh, experience in the, uh, with that particular institution. However, it's interesting to, to, to underline that interview, in interviewers, so people that actually have taken part in the survey, revealed that in particular circumstances, uh, they would widen the list of institutions that uh, they might consider. Uh, for example, uh, depending on the potential value of the dispute, the practitioner reported that they would uh, be willing to consider also a less well-known institution, Competitive fees because, as uh, Ellie already mentioned, indeed, one of the 
criticism of uh, arbitration is, is the cost. As uh, to less well-known institutions, it's also interesting to highlight that the several interviewers uh, uh, has indicated that, of course, depending on the nature and the value of the dispute, they might be willing to use uh, less well-known institutions because, uh, uh, or no, not only less well-known institutions, but also uh, new entrants in the market, uh, in light of the fact that the trust in such an uh, institution can be an effective means of encouraging a great diversity, particularly particularly when those institutions uh, may be in a position to, the, to suggest a different pool of arbitrators. This could include, for example, arbitrators who may not as yet enjoy their visibility globally, but who have a particular experience in certain region, applicable law, or industry relevant for that given dispute. Further, some uh, interviewers also mentioned that the perception of the quality and the consistency of institutional staff and counsel can influence their opinion when considering institutions. So this actually link to what I already said, that one of the elements for me, key elements in choosing the institution and also the staff of the cigarette that then will deal, will um, help the parties uh, with, uh, arbit with the arbitration proceedings, with the conducting of the arbitration proceedings. While none of this consideration uh, in of themselves displays uh, the general factors of reputation and recognition of an institution, they suggest that there are multiple uh, distinguished features that uh, can influence the choice of one institution or another. I will give a couple of examples. One of them is the level of institutional involvement. Indeed, arbitral institutions have a variety of levels of involvement in managing and administrating arbitration. Institutions, for example, uh, the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, promote uh, what I would call the light touch approach with rules uh, in, uh, that emphasize the party's autonomy and uh, entrust the arbitrators with the primary decision making power. Other institutions, such as the ICC, are known uh, for a more intensive uh, involvement in the arbitration. One practical example of this uh, completely different approach is the scrutiny of arbitral awards. Institutions uh, like the ICC, of, uh, or for example, the Singapore International Arbitration Center, engage in a mandatory scrutiny and approval of draft award uh, of the arbitral tribunal. The SEC court uh, performs the scrutiny process uh, and uh, may lie down modification as to the form of the award and uh, without, of course, uh, affecting the tribunal um, liberty of decision, may also draw the tribunal attention to certain points of substance. The idea uh, behind the scrutiny itself uh, is to prevent the award suffering from defects uh, in form or substance that could then uh, give rise to difficulties in the enforcement phase of the award. Many other institutions, uh, such as the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, the London Court uh, of International Arbitration, and also the Arbitration Institute of, of the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, do not scrutinize award or approve award. So basically, they leave the arbitral tribunal to render a valid award. This difference uh, reflects uh, the varying views uh, of the value of this process. There are some parties that consider the scrutiny as an additional um, assurance uh, uh, for, the, for the enforcement of, of the award. There are other parties that see the scrutiny as an, uh, an unnecessary uh, exercise uh, which may, might cause a delay and expenses. Perhaps, uh, in my opinion, one, one of the most distinguished features between the various institutions is their methodology for calculating arbitrator fees and also the administrative fees. When I say administrative fees, I mean what the institution asks the parties for their services. And uh, there are two different uh, approaches when it comes to calculating the cost of arbitrators and fees, uh, um, arbitrator fees and administrative expenses. 
Uh, there are many institutions that calculate uh, both the administrative expenses and arbitrage fees on what is called a Valorant basis, which is basically uh, by reference to the amount in dispute. Other institutions, like the, the London Court of International Arbitration, calculate administrative uh, uh, fees and arbitrator fees based on the time spent and uh, capped uh, hourly rates. Uh, the institution charging uh, on uh, a Valorant basis uh, usually provide, uh, provide uh, on their website a very useful calculator. Uh, they are available for all users, uh, so the parties uh, can obtain an insight uh, in advance of the arbitration uh, in order to understand uh, what uh, could be uh, what could be likely the cost of the arbitration. For those uh, charging based on time and hourly rates, a party can uh, usually rely on actual data uh, produced by the institution itself uh, to obtain uh, such insight. As you might know, uh, privacy of arbitral uh, proceedings uh, is one of uh, the key advantages of arbitration. So the approach of the institution towards confidentiality may also be a factor when uh, party needs to choose uh, the arbitral institution. Indeed, not all institutions provide uh, um, the, uh, the privacy of the documents as a default rules. The LCI rules, for example, require the parties to keep confidential all awards in the arbitration, as well as all materials uh, that uh, could be created uh, over the arbitration proceedings. Deliberation of the arbitral tribunal usually also remain confidential, and uh, neither institution public, uh, publish awards without the prior, prior, prior written consent of the parties and the arbitral tribunal. Whereas uh, the ICC rules uh, do not uh, automatically oblige parties to keep awards, material, and documents confidential, but simply empower the arbitral tribunal upon uh, the request of a party or a, a joint agreement of the parties to make orders concerning uh, the confidentiality of proceedings or, or any other matters uh, in connection with arbitration. Furthermore, the ICC rules um, do not expressly um, prohibit publication of awards. And starting from the 1st of January 2019, the ICC has adopted what uh, we call an uh, opt out approach to publication of awards, which uh, means uh, that um, a redacted award uh, may be published within two years uh, of notification unless a party objects or requests a reduction. Another distinguished feature that the party may look for uh, in uh, deciding which arbitra uh, international arbitration institution uh, could uh, include in their arbitration agreement is whether the institution has, has expertise in a particular type of cases that, uh, likely, that they are likely to arise under their contract or in particular industry in which they operate. There are indeed a number of specialist institutions that has been set up and on this in particular areas of industries. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. For example, the, the World International uh, Property Organization Arbitration Media Insurance Center, usually known as WIPO, which gathers for international property and technology. Another one is the Court of Arbitration for Sport, which administered, which actually is, is um, in charge for sports related arbitration. And uh, other uh, institutions, such as the Chambre Arbitral Marie de Paris, which administered the supervise, which administer and supervise uh, maritime arbitration. So basically, these institutions uh, publish rules uh, that are tailored to the types of disputes. They deal with and maintain also those who are specialized in that particular uh, dispute. Also, your institution that I mentioned before, like the ICC, the LCIA, do not specialize in this way. The argument behind this is that there is no need for, for an institution to be specialized as long as the selected arbitrator is a specialist in that particular field or is permitted by the institutional rules to appoint experts 
on the uh, on and relying on expert evidence from a party appointed expert nevertheless of course the parties might feel more comfortable dealing with an institution that special that is uh, very specialized in uh, the field of of their dispute another feature that party might look for is whether the institution provide for expedited arbitration which can be on a document only basis and usually before a full arbitrator um Indeed, Ellie already mentioned this possibility uh, of the expedited arbitration procedure. For example, under the CIAC rules, the expedited procedure can be applied for where the aggregated amount in dispute do not, do not exceed the um, US dollar 6 million, and the parties agree uh, to the use of this procedure, or in cases um, of exceptional circumstances. Also, the ICC, uh, starting from the 1st of March 2017, has introduced in its own rules what is called expedited procedure provisions that automatically applies to ICC arbitration where amounts in these rules are below US, um, USD dollars to millions, unless the parties expressly opt out the use of this provision. And now, with the introduction of the 2021 rules, the threshold has been raised to 3 million US dollars, 3 million. But of course, as Ali mentioned, the parties can agree to use the expedited procedure provision, even if the amount of this is higher than 2 or 3 million. And in my opinion, it's advisable to use this type of procedure in case. The parties want to save the cost uh, because for the expedited procedure provisions, uh, the costs are way less uh, compared to the, 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 regular, um, the regular proceedings. Uh, I just want, uh, in conclusion, to mention something that I think is interesting, uh, and then I will conclude uh, to try to explain the, the 20 minutes that have been allocated for my speech. Uh, is that um, considering uh, uh, the world in which we are currently living due to the pandemic, it's, uh, it's uh, very interesting to see how also COVID outbreak has, has uh, changed the, the, the needs of the users, which ultimately also affect uh, their choices when it comes to decide which arbitral institution suits better to their cases. The, for example, the 2018 uh, Mary International Arbitration Survey, which was before the pandemic, has shown that the main factors that the respondents to this survey identified as one uh, as the ones that most determine their preferences for one institution of uh, one institution over another were the general reputation and recognition of the institution. Differently. 2021 Queen and Mary Arbitration Survey has revealed that the first choice for this post-pandemic survey is the administrative and logistic support for virtual railings, which is clearly an indication of an emerging needs of users due to the pandemic. So also the international arbitration institution around the world has been uh, uh, ready to adapt their set of rules to the current needs of the of the users that are now uh, frequently um, linked to the use of uh, technology and uh, remote events. I, with that, conclude and thank you very much, uh, all of you, for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Elena. It has been uh, a difficult task for you as well because you, you did a magnificent effort in terms of taxonomy to explain uh, the different uh, available institutions and also to try to understand uh, what we should look at when we uh, start thinking about arbitration and what the pros and cons of different institutional uh, arbitration, different chambers, different regulation, uh, in different parts of the world, also in consideration of what are the interests of the parties. And I think that, 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 that uh, I mean, you, you just entered into, you just uh, depicted a frame which uh, would need uh, uh, more time to scan inside and to understand more and discuss more about the, 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 the subject matter you have uh, so perfectly uh, referred to us. Thank you so much for your efforts. And uh, uh, I didn't receive any questions so far. 
So uh, in case I have questions from uh, the audience, I'll be happy to take them and to refer to the uh, speakers. And in the meanwhile, uh, I would like to leave the stage to Claire Pouli, uh, who speaks uh, who's uh, half Italian, so I will switch to Italian with her. Of course, uh, she has prepared her uh, discussion in, in English, but just for the sake of going back to our uh, language, I will say some few words in Italian. Grazie molto, Claire, per questa tua disponibilità che, che apprezziamo molto, come quella degli altri che sono intervenuti fino ad oggi. Tu hai un compito uh, altrettanto complesso perché eh, ti devi occupare diciamo, di quelle che sono general features of international arbitration proceeding, quindi eh, effettivamente è un terreno estremamente vasto e mi rendo conto che è difficile sintetizzarlo in circa 20-25 minuti di tempo, ma abbiamo tempo fino alle 5, quindi tu, grazie anche alla tempestività e puntualità degli altri relatori, puoi godere del tuo tempo per cercare di darci così un flavor generale di quelle che sono le eh, chiamate eh, correttamente general features, quindi delle linee, di, delle guidelines, delle linee direttive eh, di carattere generale eh, degli procedimenti di arbitrato internazionale. Naturalmente non voglio sottrarti altro tempo e ti cedo la parola ringraziandoti ancora. Prego. Grazie mille Andrea. Um, innanzitutto in italiano brevemente qualche ringraziamento da parte de, di Eli e, e di me stessa quindi grazie a tutti, grazie al presidente grazie ai professori, grazie ai colleghi che ci hanno permesso di cioè, ci hanno invitato a parlare oggi, siamo molto lieti molto onorati e eh, grazie particolarmente anche a Andrea che ha organizzato e um, a Giorgio Recisi, il nostro collega che, che ha fatto questa introduzione perfetta in francese perfetto eh, e con una descrizione molto sostanziale e perfetta del diritto francese ovviamente oggi non è il, il soggetto diciamo, della, della relazione che devo fare adesso però se un giorno volete discuterne saremo molto lieti con Elie di parlarne ne attesa se volete volevo solo dire che è, eh, è disponibile una traduzione italiana del decreto eh, francese del 2011 che non era la prima codificazione era la riforma del, della legge dell'81 e quindi riforma 30 anni dopo nel 2011 e tradotta in, in italiano sul sito di Paris Place d'Arbitrage del cui Eli era preside, presidente per eh, penso, 12 anni quindi parisarbitration.com e trovate in documentazione trovate lì tantissime lingue tante traduzioni che sono state fatte ne parlo anche perché eh, ci sono discussioni ovviamente adesso sulla riforma del, 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 del diritto dell'arbitrato in Italia e il 29 marzo organizziamo nel contesto della Paris Arbitration Week, che è una settimana di, di eventi dedicati all'arbitrato a Parigi, eh, ci sarà un evento eh, il martedì sera ehm, che sarà anche online per quelli che vogliono... Eh, cioè, che, che ci vogliono partecipare ehm, organizzato dall'associazione italiana per l'arbitrato sezione francese eh, che è eh, diretta da Valentin Chessa che era anche lei come Elena all'ICC per tanti anni e, eh, e da Thomas Clay un professore che anche lui parla italiano e ehm, è insomma un bel evento se volete venire vi invito a a partecipare a un bel posto nel quale si discuterà e il tema è verso un nuovo diritto dell'arbitrato in Italia. E quindi, come... Guarda, accetto io l'invito per conto del, del, del Presidente Leccisi, che non, 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 non si poteva in questo momento trattenere dall'esprimere con gli occhi un entusiasmo totale per questa cosa. E effettivamente Giorgio potremmo anche dare diffusione sulla nostra pagina e sul nostro sito dell'evento, dell della legge del dibattito che come tu sai Claire è, è recentemente sbarcato anche delle, con delle riforme in Italia di cui per l'appunto un membro del comitato scientifico proprio durante questa riunione ci ha mandato una mail dicendo dobbiamo aggiungere una coda agli argomenti trattati del corso dell'arbitrato perché ci sono delle novità di cui occuparci quindi questa è veramente un'occasione propizia anche per fare il punto nave dell'avanzamento di una serie di discorsi che poi sono anche in parallelo e, e con uno sguardo di ammirazione e di interesse verso quello che è il dibattito d'Oltralpe. Ma non ti rubiamo altro tempo e ti lasciamo per la tua relazione. Grazie mille. Grazie mille a tutti.
And so now I, I'll switch to English and I will briefly discuss the general features of international arbitration proceedings. So just one caveat to start because I'm uh, after Elena's very complete description of the types of uh, institutional or ad hoc arbitration, I will focus here on international commercial arbitration cases and the truly international ones. So I'm not discussing the style of um, arbitration proceedings under, let's say, English law governed arbitrations, which are decided by former English law judges, uh, English judges in London as a seat. Uh, I, I have one point of disagreement with Elena here is that I think that in many cases, um, for example, Paris can be a seat of the arbitration even where the governing law is totally different. And we, we see that a lot. We have a lot of arbitration seated in Paris because of the Paris arbitration, the French arbitration friendly stance. And this makes Paris a very look, looked after. Um, seat of the arbitration, even where the applicable law is totally different. Uh, but with, with this being said, so I will focus on this international civil law, uh, commercial international arbitrations. So how, and this is often a question that, that is being asked, how does it work? What are the types of submissions that you exchange in uh, typical international uh, arbitration proceedings? So I will take the example of the ICC. Because also in, um, we have uh, at the moment with AB some ad hoc arbitrations where the parties have agreed to rely upon the procedure usually, um, well, the, the procedure at the ICC. So we have basically taken the ICC rules except for the financial parts, but for all the procedure, we are basing the arbitration and, and the proceedings upon that. It's easier than providing for all of the, of the procedural rules, of course. How does it work? So the claimant files a request for arbitration. If we're in ICC with the ICC, uh, it files this request. The ICC itself will notify the request for arbitration to the respondent or respondents. And this might seem easy, but there can be a lot of issues on that. Uh, when was the, the request for arbitration received by the other side? Sometimes you have two separate request for arbitrations because you're doing ex parte. You send the request for arbitration at the ICC, you pay the fee, the lodging fee, and maybe the other side is doing exactly the same thing with one day apart, and then you, you end up with two parallel arbitration proceedings. Of course, the ICC would want to consolidate them, and that's what it usually does, but this is something that can happen, and we've seen that in some cases. After the request for arbitration is filed, the, the respondent or the respondents will file a answer, an answer to the request for arbitration. Sometimes things are more complicated. Uh, hypothesis number one, answer to the request for arbitration also contains counterclaims, which means that you need to allow for the claimant to reply to these counterclaims through a reply to counterclaim. So you have in this case three preliminary submissions. Sometimes, and we've seen that with Andrea in a case, you, the respondent wants to bring in another clay, another party to the arbitration. So it's a request for joinder. And here you have another complication because the parties uh, to which it is requested that it join the arbitration proceedings will prepare an answer to the request for joinder. This is the preliminary part. Let's say that at this stage of the arbitration, the claimant has nominated an arbitrator. And I am here basing myself upon a three uh, members arbitral tribunal. So the claimant will have appointed the arbitrator, its party appointed arbitrator, and the respondent will usually um, appoint its own uh, party appointed arbitrator. Uh, after 30 days from receiving the, uh, the, the, end, the request for arbitration, because it's the time that the ICC will require for that party to be able to obtain a delay to file its own answer to the request for arbitration. So it's interesting because you have submissions that are prepared here. They are very, that's important because clients are often um, a bit stressed by that, saying, well, we need to come up with all of our case right now in just 30 days, you know, or maybe 45 days. We need to prepare all our arguments in response. But this is not the case. 
these documents, these submissions are really preliminary. And then the style, the strategy that you follow by presenting a very short or a very comprehensive answer or request for arbitration really depends on what the goal of this submission is. If you want to reach an early settlement, sometimes, for example, I'm thinking about post MA disputes. You have an important post MA dispute, you are negotiating, negotiations are in a deadlock. You file a very comprehensive request for arbitration, showing the other side that you're ready, that your arguments are strong, that you're not afraid of going there. You do this, and then the other side will, might might be tempted to finalize the negotiations and actually reach a settlement. Sometimes you just need to bring an arbitration claim because also in post mini arbitration, you have a cut-off date. Any uh, claim uh, that you've made, any notice of claim that you've made under an, uh, a share purchase agreement that is not followed by arbitration proceedings within a year is considered to, be, to have been withdrawn. In this case, you file maybe a 10-page request for arbitration. You just fill out the criteria requested by the court, by, by the ICC rules, actually, which are very simple. You need to describe the circumstances of the case, the factual circumstances. You need to describe the circumstances of the dispute, your requests, and then you have a number of procedural rules to specify what is the seat of the arbitration, what is the language of the arbitration, what, what is the... Um, the, what, what are the applicable rules of law? So it, it has happened with Eli and me that we, we just had like, like one day to file a very short request for arbitration to comply with the deadline. This really depends on the strategy, but the, the ICC or other institutions will not require a specific, comprehensive, first submissions in the request for arbitration or the answer to the request for arbitration. Generally, at that time, after the, um, the answer to the request for arbitration is filed, you have two arbitrators in a three-member arbitral tribunal, and there, the, usually, the parties agree that the third arbitrator, so acting as chairperson, will be appointed by a joint agreement of the two party-appointed arbitrators. So in this case, there are ex parte discussions, actually, if, if agreed between the parties, between the claimant and the arbitrator it had appointed, and likewise discussions between the respondent and the party appointed arbitrator the respondent has uh, designated. Then they come up with an agreement, let's say, um, it's usually the case, and the tribunal is constituted. The first very important uh, procedural phase of this arbitration will the next procedural phase will be the setting up of the terms of reference and the case management conference held by the tribunal together with the parties and the parties council it's an important procedural step where the parties will agree upon the procedural rules applicable to the arbitration so specific rules uh, on for example the um, hearing of witnesses the hearing of experts the possibility to have an online hearing, which is something that we did not really anticipate before 2020. Um, rules on, the, um, on the, com the comprehensive character of the submissions to be exchanged afterwards. And the terms of reference um, will be signed by the tribunal. Usually the, the time limit is 30 days from the, um, the, the appointment of the president of the arbitral tribunal and these terms of reference will contain the remit of the arbitral tribunal. So what does the arbitral tribunal need to um, rule upon? What are the issues to be ruled upon? And for this, the arbitral tribunal will request each party to prepare a three to five page summary of their position. And of course, the uh, revised uh, version of the, re the request for relief they want to ask the arbitral tribunal. Um, so uh, at, at this uh, same stage, so terms of reference and procedural order provided for the rules of proceedings, the parties usually agree upon the procedural calendar. 
And here, it's a, I, I want to touch on what Elena said earlier. It's really, it's a bit like for ad hoc arbitration because the parties are really free to determine what type of calendar they want. Usually, the arbitral tribunal will actually ask the parties to try and agree ahead of the case management conference what calendar they want. Sometimes we manage to agree with the other side on a calendar. There are specific um, usual deadlines that we follow. So usually there are two rounds of written submissions, the statement of claim by the claimant, the statement of defense by the respondent, then the statement of reply by the claimant, and the statement of rejoinder by the defendant. There can be more complicated issues when you have counterclaims, of course, because you need uh, to add a step. If you have counterclaims, you have the statement of claim by the claimant, statement of defense, and counterclaims by the respondent, and therefore you have statement of reply on the main claims by the claimant, and statement of defense on the counterclaim which means that the statement of rejoinder is on the main claim and it's also a reply on the counterclaims and you need to add a last round, not the last round, but just the last memorial, where the claimant is able to, to file its rejoinder on the counterclaim. Usually, this submission, the first two submissions are three to four months apart. Of course, the parties can agree to a quicker calendar but in complex arbitrations, it's usually what we see. Sometimes it can even be longer. And tribunals tend to say to think that what the claimant wants, the claimant should get to be able to prepare its, its case because the claimant started this arbitration. So if the cl claimant says that it needs four, four months, it is rare for the tribunal to say, well, no, I think, I think you could need less. So... <clears throat> Usually, it, in the terms, in, in the procedural rules, it is specified that uh, it's what in French we call the, the concentration des moyens. So, we're, so it, it is specified that the parties should, uh, uh, in, it, to the extent possible, raise any arguments that they need to raise during the first two, in the first two memorials, meaning in, during the first round of memorials. This means that you cannot keep a strong argument for the last round. You need to be forward with it. And your first memorials need to be comprehensive. Really, they should set out the whole story and the whole argument, which means that the last two, the second round, is really limited to replying to what the other side said in the immediately preceding memorial. So this is the written phase. In between the two rounds of um, written submissions, you have a very important feature of international arbitration proceedings, which we don't have in France, and I think does not exist either in, in Italy, which is the uh, document production phase. So in France, and, and uh, I will uh, perhaps uh, our... Um, uh, the, the organizers can uh, can explain uh, after uh, I'm done uh, whether it's the same in Italy, but in France, in judicial proceedings, domestic proceedings, you can only request for a specific document that you know exists. For example, I really want this precise document. It was mentioned in an email, and you can ask for it um, before the arbitral. Uh, I'm sorry, before the um, the judicial court. There is no specific phase on on the document production. In arbitration, it's a very good weapon that we have, which is that in between the two rounds of, of written submissions, you can file a document production phase, document production requests. It's in the form of a table. It sets out a number, a, a number of requests. So you can have sometimes, I've, I've, I think once in the biggest I have prepared, it, we had 37 document production requests. And we request, you can request either a precise document or a category of documents. And this is where it's, it gets really interesting. Let's imagine. Um, you can ask, for example, uh, for any internal emails exchanged between the parties prior to entering into the relevant agreement. You just need to delimit the dates and you just need to 
argue and and explain why these documents would be relevant to your case. They would be relevant to the outcome of the dispute. It's easy sometimes, you know, you have a you have a, another um, you know a party which says, well, no, this contract really had no interest for me. Uh, um, the, the way the way it has been uh, performed now, uh, you can see that really uh, it, it was not what I expected. And if you ask for the internal emails exchanged before the submission of before the conclusion of the contract, sometimes you find uh, smoking guns which say, well, you know, you you might expect that this party will have better earnings. Then you this is this is the deal. You see things things like that, or. Uh, we could we could uh, find another advantage based on uh, this contract, which is this and that. Um, it's a very useful uh, very useful tool to obtain this. H how does it work in practice? The document production phase usually lasts for six to eight weeks, and uh, each party files simultaneously a request to the other side with categories. So as I said, category of documents explaining what why this document or this category of document would be relevant to the outcome of the case. And then you receive this request, you respond, um, you can object, of course, you can object by saying that it's a fishing expedition, that it's basically something to, you know, obtain uh, much more uh, uh, than just a document, it's just something uh, aimed at um, disturbing the preparation of your next memorial. And because it requires you to involve a lot of um, individuals internally to find documents which are not relevant. See, this you can argue, you can argue, of course, the non-relevance, uh, the fact that it's not relevant. You can also argue, and this one I really like, uh, that um, basically what the party wants to do with this, uh, with this uh, large request is to demonstrate your own case, not its own case, you see? so. If they want to demonstrate their case and don't, they don't have evidence, then they can ask for documents. But if they want to demonstrate your own case or that your own case is not solid, you know, it's not how it works. Because this document production phase is aimed at obtaining documents to support their own case. This sometimes works. It's, it's pretty good. Generally, what, where do you find, because this is interesting, what is the law applicable to this uh, document production phase? What arguments? Can arguments be, ish, be made based on the law governing the agreement? Actually, what tribunals do is that in the terms of reference, they specify that the document production phase will be governed by or inspired by the IBA, International Bar Association, rules on the taking of evidence. And here, you have some criterion, the one that I uh, just discussed, the, relevant, the, the fact that it's relevant, the, the relevance um, for the, the outcome of the dispute. You can raise also the existence of professional secrecy, uh, legal privilege. So this is something that you can definitely use, uh, depending uh, English lawyers uh, would use uh, in-house um, in uh, privilege. We don't have this in France, so it's rather, we, we could, it's rather, um, you can, you can rather use this argument when we discuss, uh, for example, merits assessments made by the lawyers. Of course, if the other side requests this, we can say, well, this is legal privilege. We cannot share it with you. You can also uh, raise an argument of um, the um, uh, of um, uh, commercial commercial secrets, um, trade secrets, actually something that you could not possibly disclose to your competitors because otherwise you know, your business would be at stake and or also competition or things. Um, at the, when, when I started doing arbitration in civil law proceedings, sometimes we, we agreed with the other side not to do any document production phase uh, because it was something not useful, you know, well, not, not, not useful, sorry, something that we were not used to in civil law countries. But more and more now, now I think it's maybe in the past uh, six or seven years, I haven't seen any arbitration proceedings in the ones that I've done where the parties agreed to remove this document production phase. Yeah, it has always been in, in, the, last, in the cases I've done in the past uh, six to seven years, I would say. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very good weapon uh, to, to be used uh, precisely. Um, and um, 
I know you don't have much time, but then there is another feature that I really want to discuss. So it will be uh, fast forward to the hearing. Uh, so now the, the two written face of submissions are done. So what is interesting here, you see that the second um, sequence of written proceeding, written pleadings, written submissions, they are filed after the document production phase. So sometimes you find extremely important documents and you are able to say, well, you know, uh, uh, this document was disclosed and it confirms the, the beginning, it confirms what we've been saying from the beginning. Or you can also use it in another way, which is pretty smart. It's, um, it's uh, to, to, to finish on the table, sorry, the table where the party requested the, the document production, category of documents, answer from the other side. Either you have another round where the claimant, the, the one claiming the production of document, justifies and responds to the other side's argument. And the last column is for the arbitral tribunal to render a decision. So the arbitral tribunal will say, yes, I owe the production or no, or I owe the production only between January and June, because I think that two years of internal emails is too long and it's not relevant. Only the first two months will be relevant, something like that. What is nice when you're filing the next round of submission is that you can say, well, look, this, um, the party was, I was ordered to produce any document, internal document, justifying the allocation of risks under the agreement, I filed them to the other side. And the other side has not produced a single document among the ones that, it, that I was ordered to produce. What does it mean? That there is nothing in my internal documents, in my internal emails, that justifies the other side's theory. That's pretty strong. It, it, it has worked in some cases. Um, so fast forward to the hearing. Just before the hearing, there is a pre-hearing conference. I won't be along on that, but it's a conference. It's an important one, actually, where we discuss issues like witness, uh, if witnesses need interpretation, uh, where the hearing will be um, held, um, details. The procedural calendar, actually, it's, uh, <laughs> this is an important question, but how do you allocate time? We have five days, five days to plead. And we have one party who has five witnesses, and the other one has just one. Do we say that each party has uh, three hours of witness examination, which means that one of the witnesses can be examined for three hours, and the other one, they are five, and they need to be examined for like 30 minutes? All these things. Tribunals take it seriously and carefully, because one of the reasons to annul the awards are the fact that due process was not complied with. This pre-hearing conference. Then we arrive to the hearing. So hearings at least in, uh, before French domestic, uh, domestic courts, then say, well, usually in these recent, in these recent times, uh, the judge would say, well, uh, counsel, you have uh, 20 minutes. In, in arbitration, in, we usually have, let's say, three to five days. That's the general rule in our, in our case, we have three to five days. This means that sometimes we spend a full day on the opening submissions by the counsel, and then maybe the next two days are dedicated to the examination of witnesses. And it's really great because, so here is the last feature that I will be discussing, it's facts and experts witness evidence. Together with the two sets of memorials that we prepare, we file witness statements and expert reports. The witness statements, they are drafted by the lawyers, basically, after having discussed with the, the, expert, the, the witnesses. Then the witness reviews each and every single word of the submission, the statement, because this witness needs to agree with every single word because he or she will be examined, examined by the other side, like in the US uh, movies, basically. Ha the expert is the same, so you, you, well, we do, we do not draft the expert reports, of course experts, technical experts or quantum experts, they prepare reports to support the first and the second memorial of each party. And it can be, for example, on a technical issue, let's say on a, the uh, on the construction case, it will be on defects. You know, you have a specific a professor at MIT who is able to testify on um, the uh, the, the absence, well, the, the failure to comply with the rule of art 
on a specific uh, mechanical engineering issue. We use it to support our uh, argument for gr gross negligence, for example. This is grossly negligent. Look, an expert has, def uh, has determined this. Your witness and your expert will be examined at the hearing. How, how does it work? You have, so the room, the arbitration room is usually in the shape of a U. You have the tribunal here at the basis, and then in parallel you have the two, two sides, so the claimant and the respondent. The witness will be in the middle, and the witness will face the arbitral tribunal. Of course, this doesn't work in uh, remote proceedings, remote uh, hearings, where it's a little difficult because it, the witness is basically like I am right now, and it, it has changed the dynamic a bit. But let's say in proper in-person um, uh, hearings, it works this way. And after a brief introduction by the counsel representing the party for which the, uh, the witness or the expert is testifying, um, then the other side will do what we call a cross-examination. Cross-examination is an art and also a muscle, as uh, common lawyers like to say. It's a muscle because you, the more you do it, the more you're trained and the better you get. What do you want to do with cross-examination? You want to either decredibilize a witness on the basis of his or her experience, expertise, Partiality, potentially, if we're talking about an expert, let's say. And you want to contradict his or her saying or conclusions based on evidence of the case. So a typical example, you have a fact witness which, who says hmm. this was uh, discussed and dismissed during the uh, negotiations. He says this in the first uh, statement. But then um, a, a document comes up during the document production phase from himself saying, actually, I did not discuss this, but I guess they have this in mind. So it's a contradiction. And even though this witness can say in the next uh, witness statement, well, yes, uh, this document has come up, uh, um, I do not remember exactly, but... Uh, there is another email that I cannot find, you know, something trying to, you know, to cope for this. You can spend, as a lawyer for the other side, half an hour on this document just to decredibilize them. So what it means is that you need to be super prepared when you prepare the witness statement of your witness. Ideally, you should have reviewed all of the documents of the case that the client has so as not to make any mistake of that type. For the experts, it's a little different, but because the expert will, well, first it's his or her job to be a testifying expert before arbitral tribunal, so it's not a one-time thing in their life as witnesses, as fact witnesses. It's something that they do. <clears throat> and, um, but, um, the, uh, but, but technically what, what we do is that, and this is allowed by the, the French, um, uh, or the um, French, uh, sorry, um, French Bar Association, it's allowed for lawyers to train witnesses in international arbitration, to train witnesses and to train experts. What we do is a mock cross-examination. So we review the whole documents of the case. Uh, for, for experts, we review uh, publications online. And we work with uh, maybe sometimes the junior associates of the experts uh, for the, the weaknesses of, the, of their case. And we spend three, four hours, five hours, two, three times before the hearing to try and present them with the possible contradictions, with the possible weaknesses of the case, to help them answer. And so we have a hearing where usually, and this is a great reward, our witnesses or experts, they tell us, you are very tough in the preparation, but then the hearing was a piece of cake. That's what we want to do. So I think this is the most important feature of, of international arbitration for us civil law lawyers, where we don't we usually don't have in, in civil proceedings this um, examination of witnesses. Quickly, then after the hearing is uh, ends, you have two possibilities: either 
um, you have oral closing submissions from both parties, and tribunals like to ask some questions for us to focus on specific issues that are determining their, well, they're the crucial issues that they need to discuss. It's usually very helpful when tri the tribunals comes back from a break saying, ah, I'd like to hear the parties on this which means that this is probably the missing piece uh, for them to reach a, a decision, a joint decision. And then um, uh, the other option is to file a post-hearing briefs. So it's the same thing, but in writing. And tribunals usually also specify what types of uh, issues the parties should focus on. Um, and then you receive the award. Usually uh, ICC tribunals, they will tend to send the award three months after the post-hearing brief. Uh, I'm talking about three, three uh, member arbitral tribunals, and uh, but sometimes it can be a bit more. But let's say that you can expect three months after the post hearing briefs, or three months after the, the closing of the written proceedings, uh, which does not necessarily correspond to the closing submissions at the hearing, because sometimes the tribunal can leave a week or two for the filing of last decisions. I'm right on time. I think I. Uh, Overspoke for a few minutes. No, no, you didn't overspoke. You didn't overspoke at all. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, well, Claire, uh, I think that, uh, that that there are a few things that I would like to uh, to, to note from your uh, your presentation, and and I will switch to Italian. Penso che tu ci hai rappresentato molto bene che ci sono delle cadenze molto specifiche dell'arbitrato internazionale a dire la verità tutti e tre gli interventori ce l'hanno dette e ce le hanno dette in maniera diversa e, e soprattutto meriterebbero adesso una seconda sessione di approfondimento ma non limitata a due ore perché faccio un esempio e lì all'inizio ha parlato del joinder, tu hai parlato del joinder e, e anche Elena Fontanelli in un cenno quando parlava dei temi delle varie Camere arbitrali e dei regolamenti, il problema dell'arbitrato multiparte è un problema assolutamente centrale, tipico del, del, dell'arbitrato internazionale sul quale bisogna fare molto approfondimento perché il joinder e la, la forzatura, l'estensione, l'applicazione della clausola è, è evidentemente uno dei temi core anche della riuscita del successo commerciale dell'arbitrato. Uh, e lì ha parlato all'inizio dell'arbitrato di urgenza, sono state fatte le menzioni da Elena Fontanelli di diverse istituzioni arbitrali che contemplano metodologie comunque di ehm, provvedimenti che risolvono il tema della necessità di contrarre i tempi della decisione, dove il tema dell'urgenza non è assorbente come tema giuridico, ma c'è il tema della speditezza, perché poi l'urgenza richiama altre, altre, altre complessità e effettivamente i poteri cautelari degli arbitri, i poteri cautelari della, della risoluzione di determinate eh, vicende in seno ad un arbitrato internazionale e proprio la, la possibilità di convenire in arbitri, si era fatto prima l'esempio della escussione della garanzia a prima domanda, tipica forma di eh, regime di garanzia in un contratto ad esempio di vendita internazionale ma di tantissimi altri contratti dotati o connotati da transnazionalità effettivamente è uno dei temi assolutamente sentiti nella pratica mi verrebbe poi da dire alla luce di quello che tu ci hai raccontato che quando ti sei soffermata sui documenti che si scambiano sulle memorie sulle repliche poi ci sono anche delle terminologie dell'arbitrato la replica, la duplica, la triplica che sono fuori dal, dal lessico uh, ordinario del, 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 del processuale civile, ma soprattutto c'è poi la necessità sempre di garantire un ampio contraddittorio che hanno creato, secondo me, un genere letterario a parte, cioè scrivere in materia arbitrale, proprio per gli elementi che tu hai sottolineato sulla circostanza che si possa iniziare un arbitrato esclusivamente sui fatti, senza dover minimamente svolgere le argomentazioni in diritto che potranno essere svolte nella, nel momento appropriato del procedimento arbitrale ha eh, 
cambiato anche il modo di difendersi e, e anzi orienta in maniera strategica il modo di difendersi. Quando gli avvocati di civil law, di diritto italiano, eh, si approcciano all'arbitrato hanno sempre la mentalità di dover dire tutto subito perché il, il, il rito del processo civile italiano in tutte le sue declinazioni, anche eh, guardando Giorgio il, il, il processuale amministrativo piuttosto che altre forme, il processuale tributario, eh, hanno ormai eh, proprio per tagliare i tempi della giustizia obbligato a dire tutto subito e a dire tutto subito anche a fare le richieste di prova subito salvo diciamo le memorie di precisazione che vengono fatte questo per contrarre i tempi della giustizia e, 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 e ci fanno dire tutto subito poi ci danno un rinvio a un anno e mezzo e quindi tutta la fatica che è stata spesa per eh, imbastire una difesa onnicomprensiva talvolta senza conoscere pienamente lo sviluppo delle difese avversarie viene poi eh, completamente annichilito da, 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 dalla gestione amministrativa del tempo della giustizia dove effettivamente si dilungano, si ampliano enormemente questi tempi e quindi si ritorna dopo un anno senza più la, la freschezza e l'immediatezza di contenuto a riprendere il filo di una strategia processuale nell'arbitrato internazionale c'è molta strategia ecco questo vogliamo dirlo subito c'è un grandissimo spazio per la strategia e per le opzioni strategiche se mi risponde questo vado su questo terreno se non mi risponde vado su un altro terreno servirebbe poi probabilmente un corso non una, una seduta ma un corso a parte per le specificità dell'arbitrato che sono per l'appunto il witness statement e l'escursione dei testimoni e il tema della cross examination e l'esperto. L'esperto è veramente un mondo, no? avere gli esperti e saper lavorare con gli esperti e fare challenge agli esperti è, è una cosa molto molto complicata eh, perché poi là ci sono tradizioni giuridiche completamente divergenti noi in Italia siamo abituati ad avere un esperto del giudice che si confronta con gli esperti delle parti e ad esempio assomigliandosi più talvolta a, 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 ad altre esperienze e nelle tradizioni di common law ad esempio i giudici fa, ascoltano entrambi gli esperti e poi fanno fare agli esperti in contraddittorio la sintesi dei punti di accordo e di disaccordo nei procedimenti inglesi, io mi ricordo la prima volta che affrontai una causa davanti a una corte inglese, naturalmente con il patrocinio dei legali inglesi, ero sconvolto dall'idea che non ci fosse il CTU della corte, no? Ma eh, dicevo, ma scusate, ma quelli come riescono a, a persuadersi? Dice no, perché la corte ordina agli esperti di dire la verità, e io là ero basito, e poi fanno un documento di sintesi dove mettono i punti di concordamento e i punti di divergenza con le argomentazioni e poi la Corte decide. Quindi anche il tema dell'esperto nella dimensione arbitrale è un tema complessissimo che va visto sia in relazione al regolamento arbitrale di cui si discute, sia in relazione a, alla cultura degli arbitri con i quali ci si va a confrontare nella, eh, come dire, nella valutazione, nel dimensionamento della, del valore de, dell'esperto. Eh, mi veniva poi in mente, e qua eh, rassegno poi il testimone a Giorgio per la chiusura della, della, della giornata odierna, eh, il tema dell'indipendenza è stato fatto cenno, è stato fatto cenno anche qua in maniera vorrei dire episodica in tutti quanti gli interventi perché non si aveva tempo, e lì ha parlato delle, 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 delle regole eh, che poi sono diventate a prassi eh, delle EBA rules poi l'hai fatto un cenno anche te Claire lo stesso dicasi quando si fa riferimento al, al tema del, dei vari, delle varie eh, istituzioni arbitrali il concetto di indipendenza è un concetto pregnante nel, nell'arbitrato internazionale ed è un concetto che eh, come a dire Va, va visto anche laddove si voglia accedere e diciamo nel diritto italiano ci sono 
quantomeno voci discordanti sul fatto che esista un arbitro di parte. No? Ci sono dei saggi bellissimi del professor Benatti dove dice sostanzialmente eh, ma quale, quale l'arbitro è sempre un arbitro di parte e spiega le sue ragioni, ci sono saggi di segno assolutamente opposto che dicono non minare l'indipendenza del giudice arbitrale e quindi ci sono modi di vederla. Di certo c'è un, un più ampio modo di vederla poi nell'arbitrato internazionale e nei test che si applicano per valutare l'indipendenza degli arbitri e le dichiarazioni che debbono rendere gli arbitri. Quindi ci avete ingolosito, eh, really you have attracted our attention for the vastity and, and, and the wide scope of, 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 the, of your dissertation, of your discussion of, of the area that you have come across and I have been really delighted. So I want to express again, thank you very much to each and all of you for this outstanding participation. I will leave the, the final word uh, to Giorgio Leccisi that will turn in, into his uh, accurate and I would say manicured French, which, uh, of which I, I, I'm really proud of. <laughs> thank, thank you, Giorgio, go ahead. Grazie ancora. Grazie mille, Andrea. Grazie mille a tutti. Io sono davvero felice di questo bellissimo incontro che da lustro, veramente lustro alla nostra, al nostro lavoro, al nostro impegno, a quello che stiamo facendo qui a Roma. Mm, fammelo dire in inglese, visto che l'abbiamo detto, abbiamo fatto tutto in inglese. Thank you very much for your speeches. Please remember, uh, the thing I want to say is, please remember you have friends in Rome. Even for speaking about multi-parties arbitration, For other three hours, as, as Lee said, we could organize that if you give us the honor. Thank you again. You're a master, so we would love to see you again and to invite you again here. In, in, presence, in, in presence, the next time. In presence, in presence. In presence, of course. Or for speaking about uh, the Italian reforms, we accept, of course, your invitation, Claire. Merci. Our amb ambassador Andrea already made it. Thank you very much for your interesting approach. Very practical approach, coming from a very good lawyer indeed. Uh, but among all, uh, remember you have in Rome an institution you can trust. This is important for us. If you don't want to fly to London or Hong Kong, if parties don't want to stay, don't want to stay in Paris or uh, to go to the preferred institution all over the world. Elena mentioned, thank you for your speech, Elena. Remember Rome. We'll be glad to see you again, really. Thank you very much. Grazie mille a tutti.